Hey, welcome to episode, what is this now, boy, 92? Welcome to episode 92 of the Corey Shepherd Podcast, available on all podcasting platforms. Anywhere you get audio, right? Audio books, podcasts, you could find it there, and you could also find it on YouTube. Usually coming out every Tuesday, I know I come into here Friday. But if you're a long-time listener to this con- to this uh, podcast, you'll remember something called Conversations that we used to launch on a Friday. So for the first time in a long time, I've had a conversation, somebody who I've been looking forward to talking to for a long while. And we finally get together. Well, I finally get together. All you know is on me, right? <laughs> this week, we have Megan Sylvester, who for me is just an all-wrong, interesting person. All you know me and Kaiso and thing. And this person is somebody with deep knowledge in several different areas. She's a lecturer... Deep in the academic study, she presents in several conferences. Listen, it's too much for me to give in, but she's also a director of TUCO in the area of research and education. And this is our area that, if you listen to this long enough, you know I'm passionate about this, and I feel like we should teach all little children calypsos. But let me not go off on a tangent too fast, right? <laughs> let me let Megan do the talking, and let's take this in. Long time we never have a conversation, so let's talk to Megan. So Megan, it's so good to have you on. We've we, we been working on this for a while, right? So we finally here. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Since since last year. <laughs> since last year, since last year. But that's how it goes. It, it means you're busy planning plenty of work. That's that's always a good sign. Mm-hmm. How are you going? I am doing quite well and thank you very much, Corey, for having me on. I really appreciate this opportunity to come and chat with you about things, Megan Sylvester things, music things, sociology and things. <laughs> well, Latina, things is the best way to put it because you're, I, I was looking into your background and it's so diverse that I don't know where to start. So I say I'll go and start at the start, start. <laughs> like where you come from, where you're born up as a Trinidad, you're from and stuff. Okay. So I actually have been roving because right. I would have been, um, we started off in the West, my parents mm-hmm. and I. I'm an only child for both my parents, but of course yeah. I have sisters um, on my father's side. Right. But we started off in the west of Trinidad and then we moved to the east. So that's okay. a very interesting point. And so I would have gone from Tunapuna, St. Augustine, Maraca, St. Joseph, you know, so it's basically that kind of space that I think would have done a lot of the shaping. Because right. in particular, I would have gone to, you know, St. Xavier's private school in St. Joseph, and then I would have gone to St. Joseph's convent in Joseph. So when I speak about the east really having an impact and really saying that indeed you know right. um and, and understanding all of what that means we would have had a stint in mm-hmm. arima as well you know um earlier in my life and so eastbound is right. really what seven <laughs> was very important what, westbound but eastbound yes Yes. Gotcha, gotcha. So I came, I, I, I've been knowing you for a while, right? Long before you know I know you and long before that you know true, me. That is true. <laughs> Which is good. So I saw you most recently, and I think that's why we got to this point, uh, hosting a panel for the, was it the New York Consulate? Yes, the Trinidad and Tobago Consulate in New York. Trinidad and Tobago um, Consulate in New York. Right. And that was mm-hmm. a very interesting project. Um, mm-hmm. It was actually, of course, in 2021. Right. And it was during Calypso History Month. Of course, I okay. am on the board of TUCO uh, as the Education and Research Officer. So right. I was in New York um, conducting interviews for this special project entitled Calypso, the New York Experience. That sort of culminated in this effort joint between TUCO and the Trinidad Tobago Consulate in New York, where we decided to host some of these very Calypsonians who I would have been interviewing um for my project in a live discussion about calypso so it's really interesting as you would know corey would have had lord nelson we would have had heat designer styler and we would have had kareem ashi you know in terms of the calypsonians who persons would have been more familiar with but we also Mm. had dr witty who is a trinidadian calypsonian but of course he resides like two of the others that is nelson and heat designer styler in new york right ashi happened to be in New York at the time doing work. And so we pulled her in. We said, the more train is the better. Of course, royalty, right? And it's important, of course, to add in that female element in terms of Of contribution of women to the art form of Calypso. So all told, it was a fantastic event. We also had performances after this, you know, hour and a half or two two hours long conversation about Calypso. And I would have been co-hosting with Trevor Millet who would right. have been brought on um, by the consulate to assist 
in discussing to have, you know, the male uh, approach being taken to, you know, uh, moderating the panel. Well, the discussion was really fruitful. I was there as an audience member on the Zoom and I really, really enjoyed it. And I have to tell you, because I mean, the Calypsonians on the panel I knew and heard of, but I didn't know Dr. Witty, but I fall in love with Dr. Witty after that event. Because you see that Catch Us for Catch Us song? Exactly. That is Kaiso Boy. <laughs> you know, I, I played exactly. it on the podcast the week after. So that, so that was really, really a good forum. And I, I know you have more of that coming up, which we, we'll talk about as well. So yes. I have to ask you, how you reach from West Gill moving east all the way to hosting Calypso forums? What, 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 what was the journey like for you? Because and, and a ton of different things in between there, right? Because when I read your uh your bios or see you online your knowledge about calypso is 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 in depth i think you're, you're up there with the best of them but then i see you in um you're lecturing in some areas you're the academic you're, the phd is there so it's, it's, it's so much how you got to that point what 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 guided your steps in that direction now that is a broad and wide question it Let is now, one of the interesting things is that um, I like to talk about role models and I like to talk about people who influence, because I think that that is very important because I mean, just this morning, just to, to dip into talking about me, but talking about the work that I do, it is carnival time now in Trinidad and Tobago. And even though we're having a taste of carnival, as the education and research officer, I continue to do what I usually do, which is to have secondary school lectures across schools in Tobago, and in Trinidad. And this morning I had one of the schools, in particular QRC, which would have been, of course, the alma mater of uh, Brother Resistance, who was our recently passed president. And it was so important to speak to an audience of about 120 persons online about this theme for this year, Calypso Music Moving Beyond Adversity. Right. And I see myself in this role, educating, informing persons about the Calypso art form, and in particular, in this particular session this morning, focusing on how do we use the Calypso lyrics to speak to adversity? And how do we speak about overcoming that adversity? Which I thought was very important because we are in the third year of the pandemic and lots of persons have been having challenges in dealing with the pandemic. Yeah, the and adversity is front and center. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But it becomes important to say, okay, not only am I speaking about Calypso, but I'm also speaking as a role model. Right. And there's that opportunity to have influence. And so when I look at my own life in terms of who have been the persons who have influenced me or been role models to me, I think about my father immediately. And that becomes important because my father is an educator. All right. My father would have been a school teacher, then a principal, then an SS3. And then he's now, you know, the chairman of the Teaching Service Commission, you know, being involved in and in, in, in getting teachers on board into the school system. And he has many various jobs, even at his age. But mm -hmm. what I have learned from him is perseverance. Yeah. I've learned about how to use education as well as a tool to uplift, mm -hmm. to mobilize, because he also spoke, he always spoke to me about education being this opportunity for upward mobility. All right. And so when we talk about you ask me, how is it that I'm doing so many things? I'm seeing it as an avenue, not only to reach, to have that outward reach, but to make sure that you're having influence in the spaces that you have been granted access to. And so that is one of the things that I have noted about what the work that my father has done because of the various spaces in which he's been able to traverse. All right. And that has set me up to follow in his footsteps because interestingly, interestingly, though my father was an educator, mm -hmm. I actually followed the same path that he did. And when I say the same path, my father would have been teaching at the junior secondary level in Mount Hood Junior Center. And he okay. would have been a social studies teacher. Do you know that years later, I went on to go to the same school and teach the same subject? Wow. <laughs> he then went on to clear up junior center. Right? when he mm -hmm. became vice principal and later principal. Do you know that I went on to the same school and continued doing that work in social studies? And so it becomes important when you talk about role model, you talk about influence, that you look to see in your life where this has come from. But let's take it back a little bit. Sure. My father literally, because he was also a lecturer at UE, mm -hmm. and my father 
used to take me as a little girl to sit in the back. <laughs> to sit What's his name? What's his full name? Murchison Sylvester. Okay. okay. To sit in the back of the lecture. Right. And I would be there. Now I would be doing homework and be doodling, but of course, the impact of this. Yeah, space, you're present. Of exactly. course. Exactly. And so of this course. is what we talk about influence and impact. I also have to point to my mother, mm-hmm. you know, and the role that she would have played in terms of shaping the way that I think as a woman, in terms mm-hmm. of understanding the role of family, in terms of understanding the responsibility of the female in the family and as a career woman, because she too was a career woman. So when we talk about influence and role modeling, I can first point to my parents. Yeah, I think it shows. I mean, you say father is a teacher service commission, the man make a teacher for himself too, instead of just encouraging people to do anything. As... Indeed, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is real, real interesting. So mm-hmm. were, they, were they both heavy in the culture as well? Or were they, where, where did the, acad- uh, the cultural influence come from with your roots well, and Calypso? Well, that's interesting. Um, like regular Trinidadians and Tobagonians, I think mm. that they were involved in the culture to the extent that they were aware. But okay. they weren't, for, for example, as heavily involved as I am in terms of the fact that initially before being the education and research officer at Tuku, I would have been a judge, a Calypso judge. My father would have done some judging in terms of um, mass, masquerade. All right. right. But and, and that kind of thing. So he was involved in it. He has actually written somewhat on the Calypso art form and music, but I am more heavily steeped in it. Where That's did right. that come from? Mm-hmm. Throughout my years, one of the things, and you know, as we talk about this, it's so important to understand influence and the rule and role modeling. My father, there was a required activity for Carnival. Carnival Saturday was big. Mm-hmm. I never went to Skinner Park. But let me tell you, from beginning to end of that Calypso Fiesta, we were glued to the television. Skinner Park and came home by you. We were doing critique. We mm-hmm. were, we, I was learning the names, the real names, and the sobriquets of the gotcha. Calypsoians, looking at the themes. So it was like a lesson, mm-hmm. right? Because he was an educator, of course. And mm-hmm. so I believe, as you ask me that question, I believe that that is where, that is where we see the genesis of this love for culture and this development of understanding Calypso music in particular, and also what the lyrics really bring to an understanding of our society. Makes sense. Now, you have an interesting fusion between that academics and, and, and the culture. And it's something that I have always looked at as, uh, as a disconnect, if I could put it that way, because I always feel like I heard you on a previous interview talking about teaching calypsos in school as a literary device. It's something that we, we've been talking about for so long, but I, I can't understand why it not um, hmm. why we as a society not making that <laughs> merge that you so successfully made. Is there, is there a link to be made for us as a society between academics and, and culture? Is it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, we have the Junior Calypso Committee um, that focuses on getting young people within secondary and primary schools involved in the Calypso art form. And that is now coming like a branch out of Tuku. Um, then at the secondary level, I definitely go into the schools as part of my portfolio. Now, understanding uh, the Calypso lyrics, um, and using it in terms of you know literary devices, onomatopoeia, um, similes, metaphors, you know, um, what have you. It becomes important to understand that we can use the calypso in much the same way as we use poems from European poets <laughs> and poems from persons external to the Caribbean. Right. I am definitely not able to answer mm-hmm. why is it that this has not yet been done. But what we decided to do, that is by the Ministry of Education, but what we decided to do as people is to bridge the gap. We saw the need, we got the permission um, from the Chief Education Officer. I liaised with the visual and performing arts teachers um, together with individual school principals and we go in and we make these presentations. And sometimes they're part of the history curricula or the social sciences or sorry, social studies, or sometimes it's part of Caribbean studies, but mostly, the visual and performing arts teachers are the ones who teach music in the school. So you would find that there would be that acceptance by those particular teachers to have us come in because what they are doing is the practical. 
all right, more than anything else. And so we come in with that theory, we come in with that, um, you know, uh, breaking down of the lyrics to understand what is happening. Oftentimes, what I would do is that I would have a Calypsonian, of course, in these pre-COVID face-to-face days, mm -hmm. I would have a Calypsonian accompany me, depending on their schedule, um, when I go to do these lectures. Mm -hmm. These lectures take place twice for the year, during Calypso History Month, which is in October of every year, and then for Carnival. Right. So that is how we have decided to bridge the gap in terms of understanding how we use this. So what we note as well, and I want to mention this, is that some of the teachers for the Form 6 students incorporated because it's part of the SDAs that the students have to use. So it actually adds value. I then engage with the students after mm -hmm. the lectures, that is students of the upper school when they have questions directly about the Calypso art form, about lyrics, about anything that is part of what their syllabus or curricula is requesting. Got you. And it's something that when you, when you mention English, the poetry of, of Britain and stuff, that is something that is, that is bothering me, to be honest, because I, I, I guess I couldn't understand it. Too so much a way for it and there for it. And I, I just, <laughs> it, was too, it was too aloof for me. And it, I mean, I guess it took me until adulthood to realize that David Rado or Stalin are poets of the best, uh, of the highest order. So it's like, it could be applied in so many different disciplines in school. Yes. So yes. I saw Scranton talking about, uh, take the number. Yes. You know, being taught in schools in Grenada as a more of a public service announcement to tell children about be wise about what kind of cars they go into and that type of thing. Right. And you know, we have, we have things like that here that we, we I don't know how come it's not used more often, you know. It's, it's all... Well, that's an interesting point because I actually used that particular song when we had the, the, the Barrett situation with that girl who was um, abducted. Of course, of and course. I actually used that as a song to talk about how do we adapt the lyrics in this song. So at that time, it was relevant to take the number, all right? Mm -hmm. Write mm -hmm. down the number, literally. And I said to the students, because I usually go to schools where there are boys and girls, I said, what do you do now? How would you respond to something like this that happened to Andrea Barrett? I said, what you would do is that you would do one of two things or both of these things. You would take a snapshot of the car number with your own cell phone, mm -hmm. or you would put on the location and send a location, right? Message to family and friends for them to know where you are. And so we can see the value of this song, of the lyrics in this song, uh, but we can now adapt it to today's society to know that still the topic of the song the theme of the song is relevant but we have to use now the calypso lyrics to see how we could apply it to what's happening in our society today makes sense you know because so much of calypso is about society anyway and it's a cycle so these things will come back around mm -hmm. what is the reception like for you with children in school is it secondary school or primary school children or both with secondary school because I allow the, the Junior Calypso Committee to deal with ah. subject teachers and they handle the primary schools. In terms of the secondary schools, a fantastic, fantastic response thus far. As I said, I go to school both in Tobago and in, in Trinidad. What I have realized is that somehow, um, though the opportunity exists within the syllabus or the curricula for a particular subject teacher to use the Calypso, as a literary device, it all depends. It's not mandatory. It all depends on the teacher themselves. So if a particular teacher does not want to use the Calypso art form, some students never actually interact with Calypso. And so when I go to the schools now, I see a hunger and a desire by young people who would have been familiar with some of the songs that I introduced to them. Why? Because they're hearing them in their home or they're hearing them in the radio or a grandparent or an aunt or a father or mother may have told them about these songs or they may have heard it. And so even though it may not be part of what they're living on a day-to-day -day basis, they actually say to me, and I want to tell you the boys, more than mm -hmm. the girls, say to me, mm -hmm. Lisa, thank you for coming and really sharing this information because you know the boys may be more into beats and rhythms. Lisa, I guess. To this. Yes. So they are thinking about mixing and sampling and all of that. But still, the message is coming across about when you're thinking about music, because you know, they had to deal with the whole issue of soca and electronic dance music, EDM. Mm -hmm. They have to think about, you know, um, all of the variants of, of African music that may be coming into their space, right? And so what they then have to do now is think about where is this music coming from? 
where is this music? Because we say in, in, in Tuco and in the Calypso fraternity, Calypso is mother music. So I take them back to mm -hmm. these songs and then they're really able to say, oh my God, I'm hearing this in music of, you know, some of the artists today, I'm hearing it. And, and that becomes really an opportunity to open up the discussion even further beyond sometimes the Calypso lyrics. Yeah, and also um, to add to what you're saying, like, it's, it's surprising sometimes. I guess it's just an age thing, yeah? Because sometimes when I hear these songs now, and you could hear exactly where the song was sampled from, sometimes we forget that people would have, would have just not know the song. Yeah. So I was playing, um, uh, there's a song this year by Voice that was sampling an old Kitchener song. I think it was Brooklyn Woman. Okay. And you know, playing playing it for the first time, I mean, it's that direct. It's just very, very clear. If you had heard the first song, you would know that it came right. from there. But you know, yeah. it's making it's making the connection for that. But apart from what you say, it's so true. Where eh? Tuko, it's good that Tuko, because in my, if I had to tell you my estimation of Tuko, I ain't expecting nobody like you to be in Tuko. You know, I could say that. <laughs> well, it just did. <laughs> Oh God, I will, I will erase that part. Only because I, I, I get the sense that an institution like Tuco may be uh, Calypsonians. When you, when you hear the people who are in charge of Calypso, is all Calypsonians. You hear the people who are in charge of mass, is all mass. It's just a thing that we do locally. Right. So when, when you have somebody who is who might see that academic connection uh, as critical and trying to make a mark there, I think it makes all the difference in the world for, for, the, for the continuity between generations, which I, I worry about a lot. Right. So is that something that you find in institutions or your experience throughout, even outside of Tuku? Is that something you find that you have to bring to the table or are our institutions focused on that already? Well, what I can say is I feel that I have to bring that to the table and I think it's important work to be done. Right. So there are various levels at which I get involved in education. Mm -hmm. research and training. Right. Apart from this work that I do in Tuku, mm -hmm. I actually use Calypso music just as jazz scholars use jazz, mm -hmm. just as, you know, K-pop, you know, scholars use K-pop. And when right. they're talking about hip-hop, you know, when they're talking about the music that has come out of the, let's say the African-American space or, or anything like that. Because what I have done over the last 20 years, um, I, I have been going to conferences, mm -hmm. international conferences. Some have been, I must admit, some have been in the region. Mm -hmm. But what I've done is that I've gone to a lot of international conferences that focus on music. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about ethnomusicology conferences in particular, uh, conferences that would have been dealing with specific genres as part of their theme for the entire conference. So you could have a conference that's dealing, let's say, with the theme of death and music. Now, this may sound morbid, this may sound a little morose, but let's think about it. When we think about the contribution of persons across various genres, all right, we then are able to do a comparison and contrast of similarities in terms of themes based on let's say decades, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you find that there's a synergy in what a shadow could be talking about as opposed to what someone in another territory could have been talking about because right. they were all feeling the effects at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. What I've also noted as well is that I have been at conferences where there could be a whole panel talking about R. Kelly, talking about the contribution, not of, of, his, of his personal life, but talking about sure. the contribution of his musical, right? Yeah. Um, impact. Then we can have conferences talking about Duke Ellington, talking about, you know, um, we've been talking about Etienne Charles, who's coming from Trinidad and Trigon, people talking about how he enters that jazz discussion, bringing Kaiso jazz. And so I have written on that as well. And so that becomes important. And what I tend to do as well is to introduce Calypso to that particular international space. I must say that I am alone, meaning that I do not, there are no other Trinidadians and Tobagonians that would have been in the earlier days who I would right. have met at conferences. Over time, I have started to see persons come in. Right. Sometimes some of them may be living in Trinidad and Tobago, or they may be, you know, first generation and second generation persons who live and work outside of Trinidad and Tobago. But that has always been what has been important to me. I felt that this was important because when I was initially started to go to these conferences, I noted that the persons who were being sought after as the authorities 
on Calypso and Stephen Music and, you know, um, discussions on math were not from the Caribbean at all. In fact, they were not even um, from an African retentive society, nor were they. Um, There's white people. Society. I'll say it for you, white people. Indeed. <laughs> and that disturbed me tremendously because. Not because they didn't have anything to say, but because I think that if there's an issue about authenticity that I'm very concerned about in terms of who is actually really dealing with our history. How is that coming in? What is that all about? And we need to be able to tell our stories. Of course, in Tuku and in the Calypso fraternity, we always talk about by Calypso, our stories are told. And so I think that that is something that is important. Um, and so I decided to do that. In addition to that, I've spoken here about, um, you know, the written word. Mm -hmm. And I want to add to that a little bit. I've spoken about the spoken word in terms of going to the conferences and I would actually be making presentations. So I first started off listening in to understand how could you have a whole panel talking about R. Kelly or talking about, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. the Houston of really? So you mean there could be a whole panel where I just talk, or a presentation where I talk about my Calypsonian? Wonderful. Mm. So in the first days, in earlier days, I would have listened. Then I started to realize I wanted to take it to the next level or the next step, which is mm. to write. But what I discovered is that the literature was just not there. And I said, oh, this is an opportunity for me to chart a way forward in mm -hmm. terms of having content written content about what is actually happening in Trinidad and Tobago in particular in terms of Calypso music but also in the diaspora because one of the key things we need to understand about the Calypso art form is that where did it come from hmm. it literally came from spaces where there would have been slavery hmm. so that would have been Dutch Caribbean Spanish Caribbean English speaking or British Caribbean Mm -hmm. French-speaking Caribbean, and what would have been the Danish Caribbean, mm -hmm. as well as Southern United States. So we right. need to understand that Calypso now is a movement that was responding to what was happening on the plantation. Looking at political Calypsos and understanding that if we see the plantation, as we see a country, you see there would have been persons who were the slave masters and the overseers who would have been overseeing the plantation. Mm -hmm. They become like the politicians of the day. Yeah, is, and so the moment. slaves would have been writing political calypsos, even in their, in, their, in their languages and their dialects that they were speaking at the time about the, the way in which they saw the slave masters and the overseers ruling. Hmm. The, and therefore we have political calypsos. And then we talk about social calypsos or calypsos focusing on social commentary. We understand that we're really looking at the day-to-day -day life on the plantation. We need to consider these things when we think about what was really happening. And so there may have been issues taking place in terms of between slaves themselves, between the house slaves and the field slaves. Those were some of the issues that would have, you know, been the content of the social commentary. And then we talk about the humorous calypsos and where that would have come from. Hmm. Poking fun at the slave master and the overseers was one of the features of the plantation. Right. And so it becomes important as we, we, we trace the trajectory of the Calypso art form. We understand how we get these three titles or headings, not saying that all Calypsos fall only of into course. those three categories, but we understand mm -hmm. those. And then we also understand that there is a movement of Calypso in the diaspora. So when we talk about the Dutch Caribbean, when we talk about Aruba, Curacao, St. Martin, we know that there is Calypso in those spaces because you would have had the slave reality there. Right. Then we talk about the former Danish West Indies where we talk about St. Croix yeah, and St. John. And we understand right. that is now the US Virgin Islands. Right. And there is a heavy presence of Calypso there. When we talk about Costa Rica, we talk about Panama. We understand that there are Calypsonians there, not necessarily only because of the slavery, experiment, but because in the building of the Panama Canal, you would have had Trinidadians and Tobagonians going over there for work. People go and they carry their culture with them. Right, right. And so this is what explains why we have Calypso all across the Caribbean. And of course, we understand the French Caribbean and we understand the English Caribbean. 
as the spaces where calypso would have been raised up yeah, I think that's something that like, when, uh, and I understand where you're coming from in terms of the ministry's role, the ed- education ministry, that is. Because it, it, it makes me wonder, like, why didn't it teach me this in New Tongue Boys? You know, you, you, some of this, so much of it you have to find out on your own. So your PhD at the time would have been uh, focused on cultural studies. I saw it as sociology, but was it well, on culture? Actually, right. No, because I am trained formally as a sociologist and I am right. now a music sociologist. So the focus okay. of my, my PhD and um, I'm still waiting to be awarded just to let you know gotcha. um, so that your listeners could be aware of that. But what's mm-hmm. happening is that I have written up and I'm just, you know, um, okay, awaiting award. It focused specifically on the Calypso art form. Oh. I actually do a juxtaposition of Calypso music and soca music in that particular thesis. And it becomes important that I look at the issue of memory, personal collective memory that is happening because it becomes important to understand how does Calypso remain alive? Mm. There's so many conversations about Calypso dead or Calypso is dying. And we need to understand the importance, the importance, the importance of the fact that an art form or anything cannot be dying if there is sustainability. So if every year you have junior Mm. Calypsos, and a competition, and every year you have the senior competition and it passes through the tents. Then you have people going to the second stage, which is Calypso Fiesta for the semifinals. And then you have the finals. Then Calypso is indeed not dying because that is new content. No other music does that. Mm. Meaning we don't have a situation where you have um, a competition with hip hop and a competition with rap. And There's a no matriculation system coming Exactly. Yeah, gotcha. Artists put out music based on the last album that they had or whether they are going to put out a new album right Right. Mm -hmm. our music is based on competition so every year there's new content that signifies life that's not death Mm. and i think that that is important to note and i think that i I really want to make sure that the audience understands that and so this is why it becomes important to have content and to have discussions at various levels of society about what is happening with calypso so even if we say you know Calypso is music of yesteryear. We still can marry the themes, as we mentioned earlier, with its conduct, with what is happening now. And we Mm -hmm. see the synergy. But I also take Calypso to another level, Mm -hmm. meaning at a higher academic level, I look at the Calypso music and the Calypso lyric as speaking to issues taking place within the world. And how can these be linked to what is happening in the diaspora and then we downed back to what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. Let me give you an example. So sure. we have 2021, this pandemic starting in 2020, but we also recognize that there were some calypsos that emerged in that season. Mm-hmm. And you have Crazy having a philosophical song about the pandemic. Right. We were all in the world having this experience about the pandemic. But what do we understand? We understand that Crazy takes a philosophical view in that we're not talking about sanitizing, washing our hands, talking about wearing a mask, talking about the health issues, but talking about a deeper philosophical reason about how has this activity that is this pandemic have this impact on the entire world all at the same time, everybody feeling the effects. And I think that that's worthy of having a conversation about. Mm -hmm. We can also look at issues related to race and ethnicity. I mentioned that I am a sociologist. Sure. Race and ethnicity and the COVID-19 pandemic. If we look at some of the statistics that we've seen about the pandemic, we recognize that there are certain communities that right. would have been affected more. And then mm-hmm. we look now to see whether there are Calypsonians who have sung about it, all right? And we introduce that type of content into an academic conference at a higher level to let people see the synergies between right. sociology, music, and societal issues in the diaspora, looking at international you know, trauma that may have taken place. Well, congrats in advance. Your awards are like coming to me. It's something good to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I had Thank to come, very much. I know Thank who going to give it that, you know, because I don't know who have the author. It's like, who gives the first degree? You know, <laughs> that'll be somebody without a degree. We can go in and what is to me, in my humble opinion, 
it's, it sounds like new territory you're going into. And I have to ask, like, how easy it is for you to do research on the Calypso side, on the, on the cultural side? How easy it is for you to access information about the, the themes that you're looking for there? Readily available in the library? Very challenging and not readily available. Yeah. So what I've had to do is what we call within the research world, I'm also a methodologist, where yeah, I teach primary uh, quantitative and qualitative research methods. Right. So <laughs> you what we do in, in that world, we call this primary research. Sure. So what I've had to do is to actually literally go and do the hard lifting or the heavy lifting and get in and dig deep and do a lot of interviews. So it's interesting that I'm having the opportunity now to be interviewed, but yeah, I yeah, a, lot asking all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time I am doing the interviews because that is one of the ways in which I do the primary research, you know, right. um, to sit with individuals to find out what really took place because, you know, the, the nature of the Calypso um, um, art form is that there's so much, it, 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 it's so, it's so real, it's so organic, it's so alive. And because you don't have a lot of written content about the lies of the mm-hmm. Calypsonians and the scene at the time, yeah? You literally mm-hmm. have to sit with persons to get that kind of data or to get that kind of information. So that is part of what I've also been doing to be able to get the information to do my writing. Yeah, well, I'm glad that somebody doing it. And I hope you're not alone in doing it. I hope that week by week, I meet more and more people who do it not because I've found it to be, and I mean, I do nothing like a PhD. I just can prepare to come here and talk for a couple hours every week. <laughs> Hopefully to propel the culture forward. And my my what I challenge myself to do is might, might be, well, it's a lot less lofty than what you're doing, but I'm trying to bridge a gap. I'm trying to make sure that some stories are told because... We, we we are the age now where the people who we looked up to as the greats, they're starting to get up in age. I just see an Instagram post from Calypso Rose today saying she postponing a part of her tour, she's not feeling well and so on. And when you had Nelson on a panel, amazing that he performs at, I can't understand, at 87, 88 years old, how he performs and throw away cane and, you know, <laughs> but we, we're lucky to have that. We're lucky to have him record a song with Kess this year and hear that voice where, where he reaches the generation. But unfortunately, we weren't lucky enough to have Zanduli reach this generation directly in the same way, you know? So, or even more recent, I saw Winsford Divine pass away. Right. And I'm trying to prepare an episode now to, to, to show people the magnitude of the writer he, he is. And it's a struggle voice. Thank God for some websites like When Steel Talks. There are a few who really put together some information. But other than that, you're, you're right. You're finding yourself as primary research you have to do. And where's the primary research when the person pass on? You know, it's, right. It's... right. And this is why I am so interested in having these interviews. And I want to take this opportunity now mm-hmm. to just inform you about this project that right. I would have mentioned that I started last year, which was entitled, mm-hmm. is entitled, Calypso, the New York experience, where I literally went to New York City to sit with Calypsonians um, and interview them about their story. And it's going so to be launched. This is actually, video interviews, right? We get yes. to see it on stuff. Beautiful. Yes. Congrats so on that. Going to, right. And this is going to be launched later on, well, this week for this carnival season, um, you know, because it becomes so important. It becomes so, so very important that we sit with them and hear their story. Because sometimes we, you know, think we know what has happened in an individual's life. Really, the way that we actually know them is in song, as in, is in lyric, in a stage right. performance. Mm-hmm. Backstage, perhaps, if we're lucky, right? But all we see is just that front of house interaction. What becomes important for us to note is the life behind. In much the same way as you asked me about my life behind the scenes, yeah. that to me is what really, you know, adds and then puts into the content that we see on the stage. So a lot of what I would have done with those uh, interviewees is that I would have asked them about their contribution. Now, interestingly, I would have dealt with Calypsonians as well as songwriters. You mentioned, you know, that, 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 you know, Winsford Devines and the fact that he is such a, he was such a prolific writer Mm -hmm. and we have to to, to admire and and give him kudos for that. But mm. there were some persons who would have been writing behind the scenes who did not become as popular as he did. Of course. And they were writing. They were not ghostwriting at all, you know. It's just that at that time, the writer of the Calypso was not seen as prominent. 
And so I felt that it was important to speak to persons who had written calypsos that who had become hits. That's great. I also spoke to background singers. Beautiful. Calypso art form is about call and response. And I felt that it was absolutely necessary to speak to persons who had been involved in that aspect of it's but they legendary to me yeah, because I, number one, I don't know how they remember all these songs. Right. And then they span so long. Like I was looking at um on Sunday night, uh, I believe it was a Tuku and NCC production, yes, uh, in Naprimobo. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I was looking at Natalie York of that background. She, she's been she's back everybody is she she knows everybody's music. Right. And seeing them there backing up artists and um well, this youth, what was he talking about? Calypso dying. I was talking about this in the last episode as well because I saw it's Tazia O'Connor. Yes. Well, I have no idea that this is Dwayne O'Connor's son. Eh? Yes, so I'm yes. looking at him and I'm saying, but this youth bad. I'm thinking to myself, but how, where is, where is sentiment coming from that Calypso going somewhere when Aaron Duncan and this youth man open, open shows with, you know? Right. At, at high level of performance, they they well dressed. The stage the stage presence is great. Well, now I started to see where it come from, and I saw you was a uh, you know kind of son. But still, right, you know, right, is right. is exactly. is in really really yeah. good hands when you look at that. So exactly, and that is one of the things that I think is important. Instead of us um, pulling down sure. and decrying um, the state of things, I have mm-hmm. decided to look at the glass half full as opposed right. to half empty, and, and and really say, listen, I want to pull this glass up. That's of course. what I want to do, all right? And I want to look to being engaged in some nugget of information that I could share mm-hmm. when I do those secondary school lectures, some um, piece of, of information that I could impart when I go overseas, because I've been as far as Germany talking Calypso. Nice. Because what I want to do is to let them know, listen, you have to see that Calypso is not from the golden era in the 1950s. It is current. And mm-hmm. everywhere we have new material and you have to consider this. But Calypso music is a musical genre just like jazz, just like the blues, just like ska, just like reggae, just like um, K-pop. It yes. is a musical genre that can contend with any of those. And in addition to that, there's this new content all the time. So let's look mm-hmm. to the lyrics to see what they are saying. You know, and it's so important to me that we really delve into it. I want to share about an experience that I had Mm -hmm. at a conference I go to every year. It is a pop music conference Mm -hmm. um, and it takes place in Seattle. And it is so interesting because the theme that I want to focus in is, as I mentioned earlier, death and music. And we were actually having a conversation about, I, I, I did a paper on shadow. The shadow had recently passed, and I wanted to introduce persons to the theme of death in his music, mm-hmm. because we know that that is very present. And on that panel with me would have been an academic from Africa, who was mm. also speaking to African music and a particular artist that would have done that. Now, again, this sounds very, you know, dark, but it's all about talking about the content just as a theme. Of course, other of course. Other persons and other... Um, panels would have been speaking about death in terms of nostalgia, where they're recounting, let's say, um, uh, theme songs from shows on television or movies that had passed and how that had had an impact on them. But this was the death of a series, you know, when the series is no longer. um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It it, it has not been, you know, reissued. um, So it has been cancelled and they use death that's how they interpreted that. Of course, and of so course. we're talking about that. And, and, and so there are DJs at this conference, in this particular conference, and they mm-hmm. talk about the type of music that they play and how it has an impact on the audience. You mm-hmm. know, they talk about music producers being at that conference. You know, so there are different types of experiences that I've decided to open myself to, all right, in terms of having conversations with persons in the international space to the extent where this white female came up to me because after my paper on shadow and she said i googled him as you were speaking she said but he is real no (laughs) god she said he has quite a repertoire i said yes but you know what because i'm new i'm speaking in my own accent i've come to talk about music that they're not familiar with they probably think you know probably Mm -hmm. probably 
Your makeup. What is this exactly? But guess what she said. But this, she said, but I'm listening to the music and I'm enjoying it. And what? there you go. You never know what impact you're gonna have. You never know what impact you're gonna have. And so those kinds of experience experiences to me are priceless. Of course, right. of course. Well, I think your impact is being made because if you're going as deep as the background singers, I'm happy to hear that. It's like um, I was talking about that, that that show on Sunday and I was wondering, like my 10th experience, so much of it was shaped by the comedians. They tell me, Joseph, they sprang along. You know what I mean? So I was wondering how come now, like we saw a gap in because there was a time where people fighting for that space, you know, we'd have seen Tommy Joseph and them and they stepped back Rachel Price and they and Nikki Crosby and they came into that space. But I don't, I'm not sure if there's a whole lot of that coming, but I think it's good that you're looking into it in depth because even I talk a lot about the musicians behind Calypso as well, who uh, come up with strumming patterns, like catching hell to learn and, and, and figure out like what they did. And unless it's, unless they, and, and, and the, the key is what you're doing there is documenting it because when David Rudder documents it, we go know who's Fitzroy Coleman. Just like that white lady, I would Google and see, well, all right, well, this is who this is. But um, <laughs> if, if nobody says it. Right. Like, then it's not knows? said. And that's yeah. the thing about social media. If you don't show up, then you don't Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know, yeah, you don't exist. That's, that's a sad thing, everybody. Eh, that is just what oh, it is. And man. so, you know, they are, I mean, I do have, and I want to say this openly, mm -hmm. I do have uh, critics. And people sure. who say, but Megan, oh my goodness, every time we turn you are on the media, and I say, listen, mm -hmm. I have some stuff to say. I feel that the time is now, and I want to get it said. There's going to be a time when I'm not going to be around to say these things, because they would have either been said before, or there would be somebody new saying them. But mm -hmm. the point is, we must stand on the shoulders. So I'm standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before me, and now it is my time to enter the discourse, make the contribution. And so there are persons, as we spoke of, we started this conversation talking about role models and influencers, you know? Um, and so that is what I see my role as. And it becomes important to do this kind of work for people to be aware. But I just wanna speak, Corey, to something that you mentioned because I too am interested in the comedian or right. the, the, the MC. In the MC, that's right, that's right. And I think it is so important because many of them are comedians. Did you know that? They are Calypso comedians who have been able now to string together parts to bring out. Because if you notice, what they do is they always have a little story, a little ditty about the performer who's about to come on stage. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But sometimes they always, it, it's a humorous element sometimes. They talk about the way that they, they, they're costuming or what they hear about them or a mm -hmm. performance before or the right. song. They are Calypso comedians and they're also part of the fraternity. And ah, I okay. particular like the work that they are doing. And I'm I'm glad that you know we would have had Stokes and Hill and Bueller, you know, um, you know, Tommy Joseph making way, you know, for and then we had Tony Paul, you know, right. and we have all of these people coming down. Now we have the God Prepares, you know, and we have so many others, you know, making that dent in the space. And I think it becomes important to see that within Calypso, and this is one of the things that I tell students, because there mm -hmm. was a school that approached me once for Karedi to talk about what are the professions that you can have in music and entertainment. And of course, right. I would have steward in and single Calypso and so forth. Okay. And it is important that we are able to speak about all the different professions that exist. So you do not always have to be the Calypsonian who's going on the stage. You can be a backup singer. You can be a musician. You can be an MC. You can be an arranger, you can be a producer, yeah? You could mm -hmm. be a songwriter. There's so many elements. You could be a stage manager, oh, yeah? When we think about that show that we spoke about on Sunday, that show was stage managed by someone. Of course, of course. Yeah, that, and it's all of those parts that come to make the whole. Very, very important as we think about. So for me, mm -hmm. Calypso is an industry. Of course. <laughs> I, I know that a lot of persons say, oh, no, we don't have any music industry for Antibago. That aside, I am focusing on the lip too. <laughs> and my focus is on looking at the, the parts that come together and they literally come together. Because when you see a show being produced, somebody has done that. I want to talk a little bit about In Defense of Calypso by Chris on Joseph, who is mm -hmm. the son of Penguin. Sandy Joseph, and he also has shows that he produces and he takes a different approach to 
demonstrating Calypso, where he yeah. sings over the songs of Calypso, and he He's tells a, a story, and he plays a guitar. That too is Calypso. Of course, yeah, yeah. I didn't know about <laughs> him, you know, and I, this is the first time I find out this Penguin Son because I watched this man put on a show there this week gone. It is unbelievable, number one, how you could sing and remember so much calypsos. I know he had some, yeah, yeah, iPad with lyrics. If I had to sing one calypso, I want the iPad with lyrics. So much <laughs> less, you know what I mean? But but yes. his expression yes. changing from song to song, that was right. amazing to me. And Getting I think into myself, character. Oh so we my god. That calypso is about stage performance. Right. And then we talk about, you know, when we look sometimes at the props. When we talk about what's happening on the stage for a Calypso um, competition or presentation, it's, a, it's about props. It's about somebody coming out and doing a reenactment of something. Right. And then the Calypso lyric then marries with that. And then there is a, a song that is produced yeah, to encapsulate the theme. And, and the whole thing is just theater. Oh, well, listen, Bunny B is the man to me now. You know, oh, that's my what, he's now my favorite. I, see, I don't know if that song he sings is new. Uh, that uh, Sunday night, there was the first time I heard that when I will get old and when Saucy get old, I say, oh my God, this is, that is, that is, that is Kaiso. That is what the tent was. You know, you're looking forward. They are big, heavy hitters all the time and who closing show, but it's men like him who who, who going to make that thing into a exactly. memorable night and, and do exactly. that. So. And I want to speak to Helon Francis just to mention, right. to add to what you were saying in terms of Bunny B. Helon right. Francis, as well as a young Calypsonian, right. would have been using the stage as a theater like of environment course. and that becomes important to see that it continues my point is calypso mm. is not dead calypso <laughs> is not dying it is very much alive <laughs> <laughs> well you know the a part of what people use to judge it i find is the when you see a calypso show how much people in the show versus when you're going to spectacular and review and and clash in the in the, in the in the savannah and stuff. When you see Clash of the Tents, that's sold out shows, you know, night after night. So I, I wonder how much of it is Calypso in terms of a promotion then, because the Calypso as an art form, if Bunny B comes come home by me and sing that, it will score just like if he sing it in the savannah. You know what I mean? That those songs, <laughs> I can't miss. Yeah. So it's like, are we changing to suit the changing taste of the audience? Because when I was, when I was small, I always say this about, um, Test cricket as an example, right? Five days of cricket, whole day, would have sell very, very well at one point in time. But now, people rather take five different T20s on five different days. And, you know, it's, it's just a different way that people want to be entertained. You know, how much right. of that you find is changing now? Well, definitely. I mean, mm. we've seen shrinking audiences. And we understand that that is based on... Uh, that's for many reasons. For example, mm. you have... Um, the audience that would have been supporting Calypso from before, they are passing on. Of course. And so we have to understand that if we And we get old, we can't sit down for too long neither. When you exactly. sit down for too long, we... <laughs> <laughs> if we want to reach new audiences, we have to tap into what new audiences like. So there has to be another way in which we reach them. Yeah. There's the whole issue, and I'm sure you would be aware that there is the concern about um, crime and criminality, um, you know, which is just a feature of urban mm -hmm. life. Sure. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why some of the audiences or some of the persons who would usually attend are predisposed to not being involved in that face-to-face okay. -face interaction because of the shows end late and they have to consider these things. Right. Um, I think also what has to be uh, sort of encouraged mm -hmm. is a love for Calypso, but seeing it in its raw natural state. And I think there has to be a way in which we try to capture what is really happening on the stage with what we want people to learn about the Calypso art form. So I am involved in a project with the Trinidad and Tobago Carnival Museum. I am on that steering committee representing right. Tutu. And part of what we want to do, this is supposed to be, this was launched recently, two weeks ago. Right. And it is going to be at, the, at, at what would have been the Penny Bank in Port of Spain. And what we want to do is to use that as a performance space, amongst other things, um, because we're going to be focusing on mass pan and calypso and other aspects of Trinidad and Tobago culture. But to use spaces like that 
for persons to be able to come, provide safe parking, provide an opportunity for them to feel as though they are going to have an experience. Gotcha. And so that can then draw younger yeah, audiences who may not be predisposed to being concerned about crime and criminality or may not be concerned of about, course. you know, sitting down for too long because then you're going to have it interactive. You're going to have virtual sessions. And so we're going to give them, we're going to have the characters interacting with persons. And so that is the kind of thing that we are doing. And the way in which we're looking forward to have a movement and a change in terms of reaching uh, wider audiences. Yeah, I think that's positive. That's really, really positive. And I mean, the more we talk is the more I want to put on your shoulders, eh? unfortunately, because I see your the space you pick up is so critical for it because both of us grew up in households where we were exposed to the arts. I, some of it I find out you now now was quite by chance. I went to Newton Boys and we didn't have a music teacher. As you say, the, the, the music and performing arts teachers are the ones, right? Right. We didn't have a music teacher at the time, so we had to go over to Newton Guilds to get their teacher. And I know the lady name is Miss Dakota. Is must be a couple of years ago I know his relation to Art Dakota. <laughs> You know, you have no idea of these things. Right? Right. But when you look at the precision that she used to drill us with in that choir and when she had us singing, not just Calypso, but folk songs, traditional right. songs. And, and we start understanding from my son is nine now. By his age, I had understood what was a nation building song. I could have sing portraits of Trinidad. Right. I don't know if I wanted to. <laughs> they must have beat it into me in our time, long time. <laughs> But I wonder, like, it, it seems as though the role you 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 play, not just in Tuko, just the space you have picked up in terms of the merger between the academic and, and, the, and the art form itself. It, I just feel like part of getting younger people into the art form has to be introducing it to them much earlier because we're now in households where everybody working, nobody in no time, babysitter seeing about trendy society changed so much. Right. Where there's no Saturday morning, nothing for nobody to listen to. When we listen as a family, I had no choice but to listen to Calypso. I don't know if I'd like it. Right. But yeah, I, I told though... you about my Calypso experience. Right, I, exactly. I no whole day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, this I is what as... we are doing on that day. <laughs> you know, and, and listen, and you, the thing is too, it's so funny. We only had one channel too. So where you go do? <laughs> yeah, nothing else you could do. But no, so, these and, no, and that's them... an important point that you're making because there's so much. Um, Destruction now, of so course. much destruction, and of so course. it becomes, um, you know, more of a of a, of a, of, a, of a difficulty for I think for some parents who want to really instruct and mold. I think they have to physically get them involved in the activity from very young, and so this is why I'm very thankful that there's this junior calypso committee that works within within the schools because what I have found, and, and this is something that I ought to have mentioned earlier, really, and I'm glad I'm getting an opportunity to say it now. One of the things I do when I go to a school, students then approach me and say, and this was when we had the face-to-face -face sessions, Miss, right. there's Calypso in schools? We didn't even know. Could you hook me up? And I say, your school can become part of, of the course. school that is reached by the Junior Calypso Committee. So I take the names of the teachers and then we get to infiltrate a school and then get the students who want to write, who want to perform, who want to get into music, they get to have that experience. So that is another thing that is important. I think at the community level, it needs to be done as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so NGOs could be involved in bringing about that kind of infiltration into communities. Of course, this would be better done through a particular ministry, but of right. course the desire and the passion has to be there from those who head up the ministry. Of course. I must say, <laughs> because that is what is important. Um, I think it's important for us as a society to not have a pecking order in terms of the value of music. What do I mean? Mm. Some people see music as being part of high culture and low culture. So there's a way, unfortunately, in which some persons think that certain musical instruments or certain types of genres are high culture. So you're talking about, you know, okay. violins and cellos, et cetera. And I don't want to call any names of any shows, but certain shows or productions where they have European music being showcased. And you see that the audiences have not dwindled. The audiences have not dwindled for those shows that they have at Christmas time, where they're singing about matters not related to Trinidad and Tobago or the Caribbean or the diaspora. Yeah, you must call and, names or, or don't call no names? 
you can right, call, I ain't gonna call no number. names. I ain't... <laughs> but what that generally happens is that there is a perception, I think, in the society, if I'm to put on my sociology hat, where low culture, Calypso and Steel Pan and Master, a certain extent, is seen as low culture. And so this is why I think that there have been dwindling audiences, because I think as you have upward social mobility, a lot of more persons because of, you know, um, opportunity provided by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, let's say through gates, a lot more persons have had the opportunity to become more educated. They have upward social mobility. And unfortunately, sometimes persons think that when they become, when they are raising their stature, they have to raise the society that they are involved in. They have to raise the friends that they have. They have to move away from the things that they may have done. And if it is, they would have seen who are the Calypsonians, who are the persons involved in CPAN. I'm not talking about the managers of the bands. Eh? I understand you fully. I get right. you fully. And so people say, where do they gather? You have to go to, uh, um, you know. Um, they have to go up the hill. A tent. Exactly. And so I think that there's some people in the society, say, I, because I have actually encountered this and I want to say this. There's some schools that I can't enter because some principals say, Miss, we do not want that culture in this school. This school, oh, this school is an academic school. We don't engage in those kinds of, uh, but thanks anyway. And you of recognize course. that they do not want their children to be inculcated <laughs> in anything to do with Calypso, which may be seen as very wow. you know, part of low culture or steel pan music, which is, no, no, no. no of course, no, yeah, yeah. That's we have a music program, but we, we, you know, we have different instruments and that is a reality. It's just a reality. <laughs> That is interesting. That I would have never. You see why you work in Porters and Mega Hunters? I done write down two things here already, you know. I'm trying to see how I could get you on that junior committee. That junior council committee. How I could get any ministry. Because that's not something I would have thought about at all, but you're right. Because uh, it's so closely related to a struggle I have not now. Because I... I learned to play music by hearing people play music. My father and them was in Best Village and Better. I, I knew I wanted to do that. And it's almost like... The same thing I was saying about the sampling or remixes of songs so, so like Nyla Blackman would take an Iron Man song and sing it to them and youths don't know why they like it I, I convinced that it's already in them so when they hear right. the song the first time they like it and they don't know that that's in them since the 60s 70s you know what I mean right so so uh, it goes back to that same level of exposure you're talking about you're talking about community level best village and better village you just had to be a part of it but you're right, it's, not, it's very, very Trinidadian. Let me use my words now. It's very, very Trinidadian. So do better in life means to leave them things behind. I would have never thought about that. Oh, my God, that is that kind of sad. <laughs> so I try to find music lessons for my son now. Because uh, I don't want him to learn like how I learn where it's catch hell. To, I, can't hit, no, I don't know why he and somebody had to tell me what to play for me to play. But I can't find any music teacher who will teach him Calypso as the root of what he's learning. Really? That's interesting. No. Yeah. So when I, when I, I just look at on Instagram. So every time right. we go to teachers, I mean, they carry you through the, yeah, you had a learning instrument, right? It wouldn't right. matter. You had to play some Mary, you had a little lamb at some point. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, but, but I always wonder like where, how, how, how could the music education stop at the keys that you're playing and the notes that you're reading and it, you wouldn't take five minutes out of that one hour session to tell them, okay, so Lord Kitchener, this is who he is. This is what he's done. This is what he has right. accomplished. This is what I, I don't see how it's, you know, and you end up being lucky, I find, to have a Miss Dakota right. or, in, or in boys' school. He, he goes to San Fernando Boys. He, he will eventually be exposed to music teachers who will, they will teach him that. They, they have right. that tradition yes. with them. But, um, right. But you're talking about now, because I think that that is slowly uh, becoming very important within the system and within people who may have their own private um, uh, sessions where they teach music. I think I'm aware of that, mm. um, but I don't know if it's part of the formal structure. But I mm. think also perhaps as he grows, he would meet with that, because I think that people are becoming sufficiently more sensitized to the importance of indigenous culture vis-a-vis -vis, um, external culture or uh, North American culture, European culture, and valuing their own. And I think that that becomes important because when we see, um, you know, people sampling our music, you know, within pop music and, and, and you know, uh, other types of genres, we recognize. And then when we look at the contribution that 
Trinidadians have made and Tobagoonians have made to hip hop and rap and that space. We recognize that they, that intertwining. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes important to see being able to isolate where we enter the discussion and when we, you know, when we have that opportunity to have our voices be heard. Yeah. Hey, I feel like I get hit with a ton of bricks with that. So you're going to have me studying that for a long time now because that societal thing, and I want to call names of schools bad, but I, I, I will not. I, I'll, try to, <laughs> I'll try to behave, and I want to call quiet name who is for on show too, but I'll behave. I'm not going to say... Exactly. And, 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 and I hope that you notice that those audiences don't dwindle, have not dwindled. No, I and crime and too. criminality is not an issue, and the, and the audiences that attend those concerts are not necessarily young people. No. So when people say to me, oh, yeah, they could sit down for long then. Exactly. That is attention span, crime and criminality, and you know, all sorts of things. I say, listen to me. Do you want me to do a juxtaposition of genres here? All right, yeah. I have seen people going out at night. Of course. I've seen it. I've seen it. And I think it's more what the music represents. Now I've heard something to the extent where persons feel that, you know, perhaps Calypsonians are, you know. Using double entendre to insult mm -hmm. or yeah. you know make fun of, but that's the mm -hmm. nature of the art form, and I don't of think course. that it, 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 it that is so much so prevalent that it would deter people from coming out. So this is why I submit that something else is going on. Well, boy, I'm eager to hear about that something else when I'm very ready to publish it or talk about it. <laughs> eager. Because you know, to add to what you're saying, in those same shows that you're talking about with those different genres. Somewhere in that two and a half hours, they go put in a 15 minute calypso thing where you come and you yeah. sing two Lord Melody and a Sparrow mm -hmm. and everybody bongs and thing. But if you do that for an hour in that show, problematic, <laughs> problematic. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, that's that's there's plenty, plenty food for thought. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, moving away from that a little bit, right? One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, calypso as a genre. When, when this separation that we seem to have between Calypso and Soka is something that interests me a lot. And I'm not, I'm not sure if it's something you look into because when I, when, when in my time, everybody was a Calypsonian. It didn't matter if he was winning Road March, he was singing Fet song, he was a band leader. Everybody was a Calypsonian. Right. And then somewhere along the way, people turned into Soka artists as separate from yeah. Calypso. You know where that came from or why that is? Or? Well, I think What's your um, on it? Mainly, um, so in the Calypso fraternity and, you know, in Tuku in particular, we see that Calypso is mother music. But we recognize that, and if we use, we point to the genesis of this, we mm -hmm. have this dichotomy between Calypso and Tuku, and we point to Lord Shorty or Rash Shorty Eye. Sure. And we speak to, um, you know, in the late 70s, talking about the whole issue of mid to late 70s, talking about uh, we need to have a sped up beat because mm -hmm. the people want something. So we think Tempo. about the vibration, we think about the drani, and we think about the sound the changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the renaming, as it were, the naming of this new genre or subgenre, soca, spells differently from the way that it's spelled now. But the point sure, about sure. it is that it's the whole issue of when do we trace when this music began to change, and when people then began to see themselves as doing something other than what was mm -hmm. done before. Mm. And so we understand it in that way. You gotcha. know, um, it's all about beats per minute, literally. Really? You know, Just that and thing. that is what, and of course, because you have a lot of political soca. You have a yeah, lot of, of <laughs> soca that speaks about social commentary. You mm -hmm. have that. You know, because they, I have written as well on Chutney Soka, I've written on Raga Soka, I've written on Farang Soka. And when you listen to some of the lyrics or some of the what comes out of the Chutney Soka space, you know, I will be single forever. That's a social issue. That's talking about mm -hmm. marriage and family and kinship patterns. You know, that, that's what that is talking about. Right. You know, um, rum is my lover. It's talking about alcoholism. Right. You know, and, and we have to recognize that those are pertinent social issues you know, in our society and those things, that is what is happening in Soka. So we can't say that there's so much of a divide between the themes or the content of Soka as opposed to Calypso. So for me, it's about beats per minute. Gotcha. Yeah? So you don't see the rise of Soka as being the downfall of Calypso or anything like that? You see them as pitted against one another or anything like that? 
not necessarily because I know that there is a place for Calypso because as I mentioned, these carnival competitions or these Calypso competitions you need. Um, yeah. There are more Calypso competitions than soccer competitions. That's true too. So I don't see that there has been one um, replacing the other, but more, I think, soca music superseded con uh, Calypso music as carnival music. So if we're okay, talking okay. about music for the masquerade, music for the stage, music mm -hmm. for the street parade, et cetera, we talk about a music beats per minute that have been right. set up that can speak to that. And of course, you would have some of the themes, but even if you listen to some of the lyrics, mm -hmm. you know, um, of soca songs, the content of political, social, and other types of issues remain. So for me, one can actually even say that, just as you were alluding to earlier, it's all Calypso. Right. Because it's doing that same thing. Yeah? Telling our stories. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah? But it's just that the, the song is different. No, the thing about it is with this um this pandemic teaching all of us, right? We we're yeah. learning as we go along. And uh the BPM being sped up or, or is designed for a festive environment, crowds of people, street parade, and those types of things. And for the last couple of years, yeah, it's taken away from us in, in a sense where we can't really gather in the same way. I, I, I see I see this the show set up Sunday night and then I see three three chairs at a time. Every time I see something, I start to feel depressed again or pods billing and thing. <laughs> I mean, we had to do something. I'm glad that we're doing something, but it's 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 saddening to see that we still I, I just felt somewhere like this COVID thing might be about six months for the most and we could be out of this, you know what I mean? Yeah. It 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 makes me wonder now, uh with all the, the street festival and the um because I could I, I I feel like the music I've heard between last year and this year from the top soca artists, it's had a song a lot like what Calypso would have been, like traditional Calypso. Mm -hmm. Because there's no jump up, there's no faith, there's no revelry or any of that right. kind of thing. So I right. feel like it's a real opportunity. It creates a space for us to, um, to explore even deeper. But going forward, when we when we're looking at um Let's assume all restrictions lifted tomorrow. We, we, you think we're still going to see shows and so on in virtual spaces? Or is going to well, go all know, the way back? That is an interesting point. I think that there, we have definitely, um, through the pandemic, allowed for the, um, that avenue to be introduced, mm -hmm. imbibed, thought about, and um, legitimized. And I think that, to answer your question directly, yes. Because if we look at the work that uh, Kenny Phillips has done in terms of WAC and in terms of having these shows right. um, all the way from March 2020, coming um, to people virtually and having a large um, diasporic audience, though that audience will remain. Remember, people have gotten three years older during the <laughs> pandemic. And so I think that those persons who were predisposed to be, you know, have a challenge in going out, they are going to say virtual, hybrid have a show inside that I can see my children and they're going out to the face to face, but I right. will look at it online. So I think that there is a space for that. In addition, the reach. Calypso has been able to reach more people. Soka has been able to reach more people sure. online in that virtual space. So if people are smart, if people understand that that is what we're trying to do, yeah, mm -hmm. we recognize the importance of having the duality. Yeah, I ask him. It's a selfish question, you know. It's a selfish question, to be honest, because now I get to see plenty more Calypso than I would have seen if I had to go to events. Yeah. Yeah. And I have, a, I have a, a friend who is a um, local guy, but he lives in Canada now. And um, he pays. If, if there are paid shows, like I know Kenny had done some paid shows, Kess yeah. had a, a, free, a paid virtual show, he will pay to get his couple hours and see the thing live and that type of thing. So, you know, you're right. I, I feel like it reaches a, a wider audience. And even though you might have trainees who say, because I remember when they first started to do virtual shows, people first thing was, so I had to pay in my own house and buy my own room and them kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, but I think we had to get accustomed to doing that because yeah. we're doing it. Yeah. I find we're doing it otherwise, to be honest, because paying for, uh, like I remember recently they had done in New York a super cat thing with verses with Swiss Beats and them and this verses and it was a paid thing and people pay right. and they, they watch it or you wait and you don't watch it live and you wait till it come out as free but at least uh, yeah. Yeah. for me as the artist I get to reach a wider audience and there's plenty more opportunities for me. 
Yeah, so I think it's a combination of that. And there are going to be audiences that are really bought into um, the virtual space. They're comfortable with it. They, they, they are people who have really enjoyed. And I'm talking about the older populations as well, um, mm -hmm. who really like the virtual space. Because, you know, in terms of, you know, the time that I spent in New York, what I learned is that I was able to introduce to a lot of persons in New York. Did you know that WAC has these shows on? A lot of them didn't know. Right. A lot of them didn't know. Right. And they were then getting to, to see what we know face to face. And so they too were getting that opportunity. They are not going to be traveling back and forth to Trinidad and Tobago of to come to competitions. Of persons course. of the islands, persons in other parts of the world. This has now been an opportunity for them to connect with Trinidad and Tobago. And I think, um, and the reason, and I think this is an opportunity for us to capitalize on um, in terms of cyber tourism. Right. You know, and I think that, and I hope that mm -hmm. the powers that be uh, see the value in it and know the opportunities that can be harnessed. But I have, I have been able to reach a lot of people myself because I have done several virtual conferences right. over these three years. And I have been able to reach more and more and I've gotten opportunities to do a lot of publishing, a lot of talks. A lot of presentations of people who would not have met me because I may not have been able to do five and ten conferences physically. <laughs> and look again to do our podcast. No, we probably would hey. not do this if you was here. <laughs> hey, and so and that's the whole thing, and that is the opportunities that have also been provided for people to have more discussion about what's actually going on in the world. And I think it's just the you see when we talk about globalization and when we talk about this this world coming together, I think this is really you know, an example of that because people are now connected immediately. Of course, yeah? of course, of course. And, and for all other reasons other than shopping and buying online and all this sort of thing. And, you know, it is now for to be used. And so, so you know, you have the good and the bad. And so you say, okay, we, we had to suspend the face-to-face -face for all this time, but look at what has come out of it. Yeah? Of course, of course. Well, I'd ask you as well, like back to a personal level now of Calypso for a minute, how much are you enjoying this? Because I know you lecture as well. Are you enjoying this virtual space lecturing or you prefer the face-to-face -face or what's your take on that? Um, you know, um, there's nothing like face-to-face. -face. Let's just admit and acknowledge that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I teach large classes. I sometimes teach students up to between 30 and 40, 30 and 50, sorry. Right. Right. And uh, there is an energy that is within that physical space when all of us are together and we come here for one purpose and this is what we want to do. On cyberspace, it's different. But what I can, what, 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 and I've always been saying this, or I've been saying this since I've been teaching online, you can share so much more in terms of using tools. The tools, right. unless you have a smart classroom physically, Right. You are not able to do the things that you are able to do online. So I can share videos, I can share, um, you know, presentations, I can have breakout rooms. It can become like a conference-like scenario. Makes sense. You could record and everything you do enhanced, too. Enhanced, yes. Mm -hmm. It has enhanced learning. Gotcha. In a way that I didn't initially think it could. Yeah, so we are able to do more with less. And it's just been fantastic. So I would say, all told, I, I love both spaces. We, uh, there are pros and cons for every space. And I'm really enjoying the virtual space. And I, I look forward to when there's the, the, the face to face again. Okay, gotcha. Well, I know you're, you're going to prepare for one of these virtual spaces pretty quickly. I feel like I now start to talk to you, you know, and you're already <laughs> on your time for your virtual class. But there are two things I want to do before you go. First, to say, I want you back here anytime to talk about anything. I really enjoy this, this, this conversation. I, I could see where there are so many more areas that you could shed a lot of light, not just for the, um, the people in your classes or the children who you, who you do conferences for, but if, if we could use this forum, if I could be so bold to ask you to use this forum for some of your topics that you would okay. do in international spaces, because oh. I feel like the more people know about Calypso, yeah. As just one small part of our culture is the more we know about ourselves. Indeed. So that is me introducing myself as a pest to reach out to you over and over <laughs> for different things. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> and also before you go as well to say that I've I've seen you a lot. You you I, you're somebody that I admire for for the things that you always come across as extremely poised, 
always fashionable and well dressed. So when I see you on the Zoom, I say, oh God, I forget, you know. I really should have put something better than this. I forget. Somehow in my mind, when people come on a Zoom, they will be looking frazzled. Okay. But, but not you. Never, never you. You, all, you always look the part. And I, I'm impressed by something we didn't even touch on today. I think my first, um, if you could say exposure, the first time I met you was in a capacity, sort of what, what I saw as artist management. Yes. And yes. it felt so good because I, I feel like it's also one of the areas here that... Um, our artists, especially uh, when you reach a superstar, is a superstar, right? And yeah, superstar is yeah. going to be taken care of. I could put it yes. like that. Yes. But I find that what we have is a lot, a lot of very young, talented people who may know their specific craft very well, but they may not know presentation. They may not know uh, how stage presence or physical presence, how to speak to people, how to do interviews and those types of things. So when I, when I saw you in that capacity, yes, I remember thinking back then, and this is 10, 15 years ago, must be, this is a long time ago, right? Yeah. I remember thinking, oh God, boy, that is what we need. I think, I think uh, support like that is going to create more and more stars and more and more superstars and just build the genre into what I think yes. we all want to see it become. So congratulations on that. I, I think right, that, but that is something that I actually thought about before I got into it, because I think that I saw again, a gap right. that needed to be filled. And you know, the interesting thing is a lot of people have approached me because of that. Not only right. you, a lot of people would have seen me in that role and asked me to approach them, but right. it takes a lot of hard work. Um, and, and, and both artists and manager have to be invested in the project. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but but once the, they're both on the same page, it works, it works. And I was fortunate to be part of a unit that worked in terms gotcha. of that. And so I, I was very pleased to, to, to have been asked and right. to have been, you know, been able to deliver in that regard. Well, congrats on that and, and keep doing the work because it was refreshing to see you on that panel. I didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect. I just saw Lord Nelson and designer and thing I said, and that. I'm going and watch that for sure. There, there's no chance of me missing something like that. So when I saw right. you there, I said, listen, this is... Yeah. And I know plenty must have happened between, between the two times, and I was glad to get a chance to talk about some of it. So thanks a million for coming on. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you All for right, having me. No, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, right? To me, that was one of the best conversations I've ever had. <laughs> you know my biases already, right? So it was really great having her on. And hopefully, she said she would come back, right? So let's hope that she comes back. And get a little deeper into some of these areas, especially where I know that when you're listening to this, you heard us made some re make some references to last week and so on. Is because we recorded this actually during the carnival week, and it just came out. So hopefully, I have our honors. I guess to the show, the door is open to her. I hope she's a long time recurring guest, so we could get into some deeper issues. And as issues come up in the culture or in the area of Calypso where she is doing her life's work. Uh, I hope she would come back and shed some light on for us in areas that we don't understand. Or just have a, have a chat, you know what I mean? And see where was the state of the culture. And also the state of the things that she's working on. Because, uh, again, when you hear some of the work that she's doing in terms of both, both the interviews and her papers that she's submitting, really areas that I'm very interested in. And you know how this is work, right? If I'm interested in it, then you ought to listen. So <laughs> we appreciate her for coming on. And... Until next week. So we're back to conversation, right? So all you know, I have some more interviews lined up. As they come, I will put them out. Friday is the day for that. Tuesday, you can just tune in and listen to me talk a lot. But for now. <laughs>